Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Manila House, this is Bambina Olivares, Director of Programming, welcoming members and non-members alike to today's online conversation centered around international property brought to you in partnership with the Global Mortgage Group and America Mortgages. If this is your first time to join us online, allow me to introduce Manila House. We are a private members club that opened in February 2017 with the aim of bringing together an assemblage of people from the business, creative, cultural, and intellectual communities who are drawn to each other by a shared interest to continuously learn about art, culture, business, food, politics, and from the diversity of their fellow members themselves. It is a community of curious, committed, and caring individuals, and it lives beyond um, the physical confines of the club. We began our webinar series in May 2020, covering and encouraging discussion about a range of topical issues from business and investment to health and wellness and arts and culture. We have featured both local and international speakers and continue to broaden our reach among members and non-members alike. Our previous webinars are all available for viewing on the Manila House YouTube channel. That said, for the non-members among us, you might like to consider membership to Manila House. We have a limited number of memberships still available. Please email membership at manilahouseinc.com for more information. We also hope that our members are enjoying their delicious food boxes, courtesy of GMG and American Mortgage. Please be informed that Manila House is open for dine-in to fully vaccinated members and their guests. And our takeaway service is open to the public. Please call us on 0917-816-3685 to place your orders. And now let's talk property, specifically how to buy property overseas and how to get a mortgage to buy property overseas. How many of us have considered buying a second home abroad or perhaps a pied terre for our children to have access to while studying in the US or Canada, for example? In many instances, buyers have had to pay in cash because they would have been ineligible for a mortgage. Our speakers today are here to tell you that you can indeed buy property abroad and the process does not have to be mystifying. So please allow me to introduce today's speakers. Donald Clip is the co-founder of the Global Mortgage Group. With over 25 years of financial services experience, Donald Clip's career spans from being an equity research analyst to managing a global equities division for the second largest bank in the world. His strengths in building successful financial services businesses have proven valuable for GMG and America Mortgages in building a firm with best practices in sales, client coverage, and business processes. He is passionate about creating a culture of excellence at GMG, as well as incorporating ESG factors into how we work as a firm and individually. Donald founded GMG with Robert, in, Robert Chadwick, our other speaker, in 2018 to address the need for better mortgage options for those looking to purchase investment property overseas, initially in the US and has now expanded to the UK, Canada and Australia. Also joining us is Robert Chatwick, who is the CEO of America Mortgages. Robert has had over 25 years of financial services and mortgage lending experience ranging from the founder and CEO of one of Hawaii's earliest and largest real estate publications, which after 13 years was sold to one of the nation's largest publishers. He also managed the wholesale lending division for Fremont Bank, dealing directly with regional and national banks and brokers. He managed a wholesale lending division for Morgan Stanley Saxton Capital, dealing directly with regional and national banks and brokers. He also managed a retail lending team, dealing directly with clients looking to purchase or refinance real estate, both residential and commercial. He is a serial entrepreneur, having founded and invested in various companies in multiple industries. He co-founded Global Mortgage Group in 2018 and now America Mortgages, seeing a need for a truly globalized approach for real estate investors to obtain a mortgage in countries outside of their country of domicile and passport. So with that, let me just, um, before we proceed, let me just... Um, mention a few ground rules. Um, this event is being recorded and is actually live streaming on Facebook as well and will be up on the Manila House YouTube channel in a day or two. Please use the chat box and the Q&A box for any questions and comments and we'll get to your questions as we go along. Thank you. So now shall I turn over to you, Donald? Great, thank you, Bambina, for the lovely introduction. Um, I'm gonna share my screen 
now there we go all right so does that is that working yeah okay yeah um okay cool well again yes thanks bambina uh, that was a uh, quite an introduction um so hi everybody it's uh, great to be back in the philippines although um virtually um and also thanks for spending uh the evening uh with us and we definitely plan to make it worth your while um, first off, I'm going to give an introduction of myself, Robert, and Global Mortgage Group. Um, okay, oops. Oops. Okay. Um, Global Mortgage Group. So, you know, I think a lot of, the, a lot of this was covered in Bambina's uh, introduction, but, you know, we're a global real estate, uh, international real estate financing specialist. Uh, our particular focus is with high net worth clientele globally. Uh, we've got offices in Singapore, Hong Kong, Seoul, Manila, you know, and throughout Asia, as you can see. Now, in a short period of time, we've been able to um, be engaged with 300 lending relationships globally, um, 150 in the U.S. and 150 elsewhere. Um, and these are traditional banks, wholesale banks, private lenders, credit funds, family offices, et cetera. Our core markets are the US, UK, Canada, Australia, Singapore, and Europe on a case-by-case -case basis. Our US business is through our wholly owned subsidiary, America Mortgages, uh, which we're applying for our banking license as well. And Robert is the CEO of that, that business. Robert is a co-founder of Global Mortgage Group uh, with me. And I spend most of my time focusing on uh, Global Mortgage Group. So a quick background about us. Um, so as Bambina said, I've been in the financial services industry for quite some time, longer than I want to admit, um, in various capacities in fund management, family offices, and investment banking. And Robert has spent a similar period of time in financial services, specifically in uh, wholesale uh, residential lending in the U.S. with some of the biggest uh, firms uh, out there. Um, Next is, you know, we, in a short period of time, we've been able to fill this, this niche. Uh, now, I don't want to make this uh, presentation about kind of, you know, how amazing we are, but, you know, what my point is that, you know, we're really good at what we do. We've won a bunch of awards uh, as best in class in what we do. Um, and, and I think that's important to, to relay out that, you know, our credibility, our professionalism and how we go about, you know, this business. Um, now, the mission statement of the, Sorry, I want to just try sharing your slides again. I can't seem to, they're not coming out. Yeah, we can't see the slides. So. Oh, oh, is that better? No. How about now? Hang on. No. Have you pressed, did you press share screen? I did. Um, okay, hold on. Share screen again. Desktop to share. Okay, is can you see you it now? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. A short glitch. Uh, so let's go back to uh, the awards. I think that's important. No, so we've, as mentioned, we've, you know, um, over a short period of time, won uh, several awards in terms of how we operate and best in class and how we fill this niche in the market for, you know, uh, professional real estate financing uh, to international clientele. Um, our mission statement, uh, if you will, or core purpose, this is, this is really important because it guides us uh, in all of our decision making. And we want to democratize non-resident mortgages globally. And that is to say, getting a mortgage for investment purposes should not only be available for the wealthy, but it should be made easier, cheaper, and more transparent for everyone. Now, I'm, um, you know, I'm going to use the U.S. as an example when I talk about the landscape, the problems, the opportunities. But this is consistent with all the major uh, investment uh, property destinations. Okay, so in the U, in the U.S., let me move this up. If you look here in the US over the last 10 years, you can see that um, 100 to 200 billion US has been purchased by foreign nationals. Now, if you look at the dark gray area, sorry, dark blue area, you can see that 50 to 100 billion was purchased by non-resident foreign nationals, okay? So this is really important because in terms of the foreign nationals that live abroad, this only accounts for 1% 
of total home sales in the US. Now you have to keep that number in mind because it's gonna be very relevant later. Now, this is even more interesting. Of that amount, 60 to 70% pay with cash. Now, there's several reasons uh, for this, which we'll get into, but if you look at the global standard, this is well over 90%, i.e., if you buy property, you get a mortgage. Now, that number has changed over the past one or two years because people have made money off shares and cryptocurrency and other asset sales. So there are more people paying cash, but it's not you know, 60 70%. So why is this? So there, I don't want to get uh, too deep into sort of the financial plumbing of why this is happening, but focus some on, on some of the subjective issues. So for example, one, as I said earlier, um, you know, foreign nationals are only one to 2% uh, of total uh, mortgages in the US. So banks and loan officers are not really incentivized or motivated to really help. And obviously there's also cultural uh, uh, nuances where, you know, somebody in the U.S. Uh, may not understand sort of the intricacies of an overseas borrower and obviously time zone issues. You know, you have to wait, you have to wake up in the middle of the night, speak to your loan officer. Now for us, this is actually all we do. A hundred percent of what we do are actually clients or borrowers that don't live in the country. And these are foreign nationals or expats. Now, through our global footprint of offices, we're in the same time zone as our clients. And we also have a cultural understanding, whereas, you know, the borrowing capacity of somebody in China or the willingness to, you know, willingness or availability of, uh, 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 you know, qualifying requirements, we know the difference between India, China, UK, Canada, Philippines, for example, we know what's the best time um, embassies are available. We know uh, onshore tax accountants that could help. And this is what we bring to the table. Um, second is an information gap. And I, I, I'll explain some of this a little bit later, but you know, for, for foreign nationals looking to buy, say in the US, the lenders are actually not banks. They're, they're wholesale lenders. And many don't know that wholesale lenders account for 60% of the mortgage market. Now there's actually no way for an overseas borrower to get direct access because they, they're wholesale, they have to deal with licensed agents or licensed brokers, which we are, and we're the only ones who have an office overseas. Now, um, you know, and as you can see, 60% of the market uses wholesale lenders. So this is not a new phenomenon. This is, this is how things are done in the US. Now, you know, I said early on in the presentation, we now have 150 uh, direct lending relationships in the US. So we've done the hard work for you. We found the best lenders for you. And in the wholesale lending market, the lenders compete on pricing. So you get the, the, you get the benefit of that. Whereas if you go into a bank, they're selling you their own bank program. So you don't get, you know, competition on rates. Uh, last but not least, one of the problems is that mortgages have always been created for their own citizens. So to the extent that a bank will accommodate a foreign national, they're just, they're just tweaking the program to accommodate. Now, I'll explain some of this in, in uh, subsequent slides, but the current national approval rate for mortgages are 60%. So that is to say that 98, 99% of the overall pie are US citizens that qualify that are in the US and that's 60%. Can you imagine the approval rate for a foreign national living abroad? It is really, really low, right? Our solution, well, our mortgages are created specifically for our clients. We're not selling what we wanna sell, we're selling what our clients need. So we work with our lenders to create programs specifically for our foreign national um, clients. Our approval rate is 97%. Banks in the US that target foreign nationals through our data, it's 20 to 30% max. A lot of those loans get rejected one, two weeks before uh, the finish line. Now, non-bank lenders. So this is, you know, this is something that, you know, many don't, uh, don't understand in the market. I mean, if you look at here, non-bank lenders in the US, and these are banks that don't take 
uh, in the customer deposits, um, they account for 60% of the mortgage market. So for example, in 2020, $4.4 trillion worth of loans was originated of that 2.6 trillion non-bank lenders, okay? Now, if you look at the year-on-year -year growth, it's staggering, it's doubled. 2019 to 2020, it's doubled. So, you know, we're bringing common, uh, common and best practices in the US to our international clientele. Okay, so this is, you know, for before we get into the, uh, the, the rest of the presentation, I wanted to sort of clarify and, and explain the differences between regulated and unregulated loans, because this exists in all major markets. You know, oftentimes we get clients that say they read in the Wall Street Journal that prime rates are super low. Why can't I get that? Well, those are regulated loans by, so for example, in the US, you know, regulated loans are for citizens. Um, they're for people with very good credit score, they're a salaried employee, but more importantly, the lending guidelines are based on what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's underwriting criteria, because the banks are moved over to the balance sheet of those entities, okay? Um, and banks traditionally are sort of subsidized. They're subsidized by the government to promote home ownership, um, you know, and, and those type of issues. The, the lenders for regulated products are traditional retail banks. Uh, they would definitely have the lowest rate, but they're the hardest to qualify. They're a very high rejection rate and it's getting harder and harder. Unregulated loans are basically uh, the loans that, that we would be offering. Um, so anytime a non-resident foreign national is looking to buy a home in the US and requires a mortgage, those are always unregulated loans. They're called different things in different markets. In the US, they're non-trid, non-conforming. Uh, in the UK, they're called buy-to-let loans. You know, these loans, you know, um, uh, will accept overseas income, overseas credit, and accept uh, entrepreneurs. They're very more flexible. And the type of lenders, these would be wholesale lenders, private lenders, credit unions. They're easier to qualify, higher acceptance rate. And I think that's, that's something that needs to be, you know, understood. Now, the pricing of, of unregulated, mor unregulated mortgages tend to come from how um, the secondary market of these notes are trading, as opposed to, say, dictated by, you know, central banks. Now, historically, uh, unregulated mortgages were uh, significantly higher than regulated, but not anymore. I think competition, because it's 60% of the market, competition has brought those rates down very close to what a sort of an onshore citizen would be paying. Okay, so let's get into sort of the meat of the presentation. So, you know, like we said earlier, Global Mortgage Group is an international mortgage specialist. These are our core markets. Now the United States, I'll let my business partner and co-founder Robert um, go into that in more detail, but I'll focus on UK, Canada, Australia uh, over the next few slides. So the UK, obviously a very, very, um, you know, uh, busy market for us, uh, especially in Asia. Um, our lenders, you know, range from, you know, retail banks to private lenders to quasi-private banks. Um, you know, the lenders will, some lenders will require assets under management, some won't. Uh, so it, var it varies, but our loan to value can go up to six, six, 65 to 70%. Um, the tenure of the loans, range from five to 25 years. The rates, these are all based off a of Bank of England tracker rate, but which is not that high at the moment, but all inclusive, these range two to 4%. Time to close is, you know, three months and above, you know, the banks normally charge a small fee. Now the variables that, that affect the pricing are, you know, how much assets are you willing to put down, if any? Um, do you have any existing uh, UK credit footprint? Uh, the type of home? What is the rental income of that property? Okay, so these are all fairly standard. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about bridge lending, um, you know, throughout the presentation. But it's, it's worth noting that in every market, US, Canada, UK, Australia, you name it, 
the business has been very good. In fact, it's what we call a, a seller's market because if you're not able to, to get your financing in place, you may lose out on the property. So it's really common, for, common now in these markets to use a bridge loan to quickly purchase the property and then take your time to refinance that with a traditional bank loan. Now you could you know, use that time to create a local credit footprint, um, but these, these loans are very quick to close. Or if you have property that you purchased in the, in the past um, that's gone up significantly, we can pull out, uh, pull out cash from the equity and per, say, for example, in the US and use that cash to buy a home in France where qualifying is more difficult. And this is by far probably our most popular solution at the moment. In Canada, uh, it's, uh, very similar, the loan to value is up to 65%. Um, the loan tenure is 25 to 60 years and rates are very low. They range from two to 3%. Time to close is fairly standard. It's at least three months. Um, the debt to income to qualify is 40%. What makes Canada a little bit unique is that the lenders are actually banks. So these are tend to be regulated loans. Bridge lending uh, would be unregulated, but in Canada, as we I discussed earlier, these would really be um, you know regulated loans, even if you're a foreign national. Now Australia, again, a super hot market, a hot market especially for foreign nationals. Um, you know, the loan to values uh, that we can lend up to are up to 65%, uh, tenure up to 25%. And depending on the lender and the speed and the qualifying requirements, the rates range from 3.9% up to 5.5%. Time to close, one to three months. Again, like anything in life, the cheaper something costs, the more, more paperwork you're gonna have to complete and more questions. Um, you know, signing and signing the closing documents uh, for these countries would either be at the local embassy or or, or a, um, a licensed law firm of that country. So, for example, if you're in Hong Kong or in the Philippines, you could find a Australian licensed law firm. We've never had an issue uh, with this. Okay, the loan process. I mean, this is a very sort of high level process. It's fairly consistent. Um, you know, the step one would be a consultation. You speak to our loan officer. We really understand what is your specific requirement? Is the asset held in a trust? Is it held in an offshore vehicle? Maybe you are uh, an entrepreneur or you report low income, but you're asset heavy. Um, we gather that information and then we enter a research process where we identify um, the best lending options for your specific criteria. Then we speak to the client and present those options. Typically it's three to five options. And then we discuss the pros and cons, the client makes their decision, and then we go into the application process. This is where our team works with the client to gather the, the information to formally apply for the loan. Um, then the lenders will issue some form of an approval, whether it's pre-approval, conditional approval. Once that's done, the remaining period of time is used to clear these conditions. Now, you know, some loans are easier, some loans are harder. You know, if the loan process goes over the end of the month, we may need to ask for another set of uh, documents. But our team is there to, to walk this process uh, through throughout the entire uh, uh, life of the loan, loan process. Then it's signing, usually at an embassy or law firm, and then it's funding. Um, and given that you know, our focus is really high net worth, we spend a lot of time working with family offices and private banks. Uh, a lot of what we do is international specialty real estate lending, and these are larger ticket uh, transactions. Um, global mandate, they're more complex. Um, and they're more institutional in nature. And it could be, you know, a family office or high net worth individual wants to purchase a golf course and maybe a hotel in, in the UK. And we take those assets and then we find a, a, a loan option for that. So that's a quick snapshot of our, uh, you know, our capabilities outside of the US. 
For the remainder of the presentation, I'll hand this over to my co-founder, Robert Chadwick, who's the CEO of America Mortgages, our wholly owned subsidiary uh, in the US. Robert, over to you. Thank you, Donald. Uh, thank you, uh, Manila House and everybody uh, joining in. If we could go to the first slide, Donald. Sure. So uh, America Mortgage is, we are very unique. We focus only on foreign nationals and expats. So as Donald mentioned earlier, we don't deal with anybody that's living in the US. Everybody is living somewhere abroad. Uh, we're wholly owned by Global Mortgage Group. So as we realized that the need for US properties uh, increased, we launched uh, American Mortgage to be able to solve a lot of, a lot of uh, borrowing situations that borrowers had. We have uh, our, main our main US office is in San Antonio, Texas, and our Asia headquarters is in Singapore. Currently right now, we have uh, approximately 150, maybe a little bit more, direct lending relationships with banks and uh, specialty lenders and US lenders in general. Um, we have over, uh, I mean, we can lend in all 50 states, and um, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Global Mortgage Group, and I'm running uh, the American Mortgage Division. So next slide. So what makes uh, American Mortgages unique? Um, again, as I said earlier, we our only focus is providing foreign national and US expat mortgages. So if you take a, uh, you were to go to a, a regular bank in the US or you call up uh, even a local bank in, in whatever country that you are, and if they offer uh, US financing, it's going to be very restrictive. Um, for example, in the US, for every thousand clients they have, one person is going to be an expat or a foreign national. So it's not that they can't, they always can't do it, it's for some, it's they would rather not deal with it. There's more paperwork, the understanding of the income, et cetera. It's just not their, uh, what they would prefer to do. So for that reason, all the issues that you would have getting a foreign national, getting a loan as a foreign national, such as not having US credit, foreign earned income, foreign bank accounts, et cetera, you're not going to have with us. We've already worked out all the, uh, all the kinks and we've been able to make it a very smooth process. So in order to qualify for a US mortgage, you do not need US credit. Uh, you can use credit from your home country. So the Philippines credit as a, their own credit reporting agency, perfectly fine. Um, foreign earned income, absolutely fine. Uh, foreign bank accounts. So bank, banks that, that possibly will allow a foreign national or an expat to, um, to purchase property, a lot of times they require you to have a US bank account. In this case, there's no requirement to open up a US bank account. Um, all of our loan programs are direct lending programs. So we're working directly with the bank or the wholesale lender. Uh, for a US expat uh, living in Manila or, or elsewhere, uh, you can get up to 80% leverage. Uh, for a foreign national, you can get up to 75%. Uh, what makes us again unique is all of our loan officers and our support staff work on your time. So, uh, you know, you're not staying up two, three o'clock in the morning to talk to New York. That's what we're doing. Uh, next slide, please. So, the US loan programs for foreign nationals, um, so you're able to get up to 75% loan to value on a purchase. On a refinance, you're able to get up to 70%. And that's also for a cash release. So whether you're looking to, you know, perhaps lower your interest rate or you're looking to extract equity out of your, uh, out of your property, you can get up to 70%. Because we realize that foreign nationals and US expats um, are unique and they have different ways to, uh, to qualify, we've made this very simple. So because we're doing loans from somebody from uh, you know, Shanghai to Sydney to, to Manila, we make it uniform. So rather than going through all your tax returns, your pay stubs and all, you know, all of these requirements that would be for a standard bank, all we require is if you're employed, it's a letter from your employer. If you're self-employed, it's a letter from your accountant stating your last two years income and year to date. It's very simple. 
Um, if for some reason you don't show sufficient cash flow, um, you earn more money than, uh, than what you're able to show that you're able to service, uh, we can go off of just strictly the rental income of the property. So we're not going to ask you for any income documentation. We're going to use the income generated from the rental property that you're buying or that you currently own, and we're going to use that as the income in order to qualify. For, um, and I'll go into this a, a little bit in another slide, but for high net worth borrowers, um, we have it even more simple. All we need to see is if you have a, a stock, bond, uh, crypto, some sort of portfolio that is fairly liquid, there's no encumbrance in the portfolio at all. All we're going to do is see two months of those bank statements and the average balance, and we're gonna use that to calculate your affordability. It's very, very simple, very straightforward, no income required. Um, so no US credit, it's not a problem. Um, we can use your credit out of Manila. If for some reason you don't have sufficient credit, uh, there's always workarounds. Uh, these loan programs are for purchase, refinance, uh, cash out, uh, you know, equity release. Basically, we cover the whole gambit of what you would do for US real estate. Minimum loan amount for the US is 150,000. So if you look at a minimum purchase price or a minimum value of property, it should be around 200,000. Uh, maximum for these standard mortgages is 5 million. Um, so the loan options that we have, uh, this is quite unique to the US. All loans are amortized over 30 years, if, if you choose, uh, regardless of the borrower's age. So whether they're 19 or 99, it's still a 30 year mortgage. We have fixed rates at five years, seven years, 10 years and 30 year fixed terms. Um, and I think one thing that we have, it's very unique, especially for an investor that's looking for uh, increased cash flow, is we have a 10 year interest only. And what that is, is it's a fixed loan. So just as an example, say it's fixed at 5%, that loan is interest servicing only for the first 10 years. After that 10 year period, it converts into a principal and interest loan into a 30 year fix. So the total tenure of the loan is 40 years. So if you're looking at maximizing your cash flow, it's really a smart, a smart loan. Next slide, please. Uh, US uh, expats, we try to make this as easy as walking into the bank in the US. I mean, we probably receive, it's no exaggeration, uh, 10 inquiries a month, maybe more, where borrowers have gone to traditional banks or online lenders uh, as a US expat, they get to the very end and then the bank says, oh, wait, you're, you're earning your income in, in Manila or in Singapore and Hong Kong, I'm sorry, we can't help you. With our loan programs, they are very, very specific to the fact that you are not living in the US and you are making your income overseas. So if you were to uh, use your tax returns, pay stubs, bank statements like you would for a regular conventional loan, absolutely fine. What makes us different and what makes us very unique, we don't require you to have a W-2. We realize that you're working for a foreign company, likely you're not going to have a W-2 and we have a work way around it. Um, we also offer the same programs that we have for the foreign nationals. If for some reason you're not showing sufficient income, but you do have the cash flow, we can go off of the rental income of the property and we won't require any income documentation from you. And again, the same thing for the high net worth borrowers, we can go off of the portfolio loan. A lot of expats will have, um, you know, they've been abroad 10, 20 years, whatever it may be, and they no longer maintain a US credit footprint. That's not a problem either. Again, just like a foreign national, we would treat you as a, um, as a foreign national. So your loan to value would be decreased slightly to 75% on a purchase, 70% on a refi, but it would allow you to, um, to still borrow, uh, again, as a US citizen. The good thing about this is you start reestablishing your credit. So within a few years, you can actually go back into a conventional loan. Uh, again, same minimum loan amount, 150,000 with a maximum of 5 million and the same loan options. Next slide. So the high net worth uh, loan programs, we have been, um, really very, very busy in this market, especially recently. Um, a lot of high net worth uh, buyers for the New York market, for California and certain areas, certain ski areas, et cetera, 
So on these loans, five million to really no maximum. Um, the loan to value is slightly reduced because of the loan size to 60%. Uh, there's multiple ways to qualify. So if you uh, are filing tax returns, it could be tax returns in, in, uh, in the Philippines, perfectly fine. Um, or you want to qualify off of, of the portfolio loan. Now the portfolio loan, uh, it's, it's, the term is called asset depletion, but there's no AUM required and there's no encumbrance of the portfolio at all. All we're going to do is take the two months of the statements and we're going to use that as a calculation to see what your debt serviceability is. And that's what you'll be able to qualify off of. Um, again, for purchase, refinance, equity release, absolutely perfectly fine. For these loan programs, there's a minimum loan amount of 5 million and a, a maximum uh, there is not. Um, again, same thing, amortized over 30 years, regardless of age, various fixed options, and also what is available, which makes us very unique to banks, is we have a 10-year interest-only option for these programs. So if you have a large mortgage and you put it into an interest-only, you're going to see a significant uh, reduction in, your, uh, in, in what you're spending a month for your mortgage. Next slide, please. So the type of loans that we offer, we cover the entire spectrum. We have specialists for each type of, of loan product. So we look at residential properties as a one to four unit. So if you're going to buy a, a single family home, absolutely fine, or a fourplex, we would look at that and we would price that the same as any other residential property. Commercial properties, we consider it if it's an apartment building or, or residential, Anything over five units would be considered commercial for us. Um, in, in that, it depends on the type of property, uh, the location, et cetera, but we can normally get up to 60% financing. Uh, commercial buildings, very similar to that. Uh, portfolio loans, we see a lot of this uh, throughout Asia. Um, you know, You start acquiring properties and you're using individual mortgages uh, to pay for it, or if say you've paid cash, um, we require a minimum of five properties and a total cumulative value of uh, $1 million. Now, each property can be as inexpensive as $50,000 US dollars. So we call it per door. So per door, it can be $50,000. Um, and what it does is it will we'll do a, uh, we'll get appraisals on each property, of course but we'll make it into one loan. So and rather than writing out you know, 20, 30 uh, mortgage payments uh, to 20 or 30 different banks, you're writing one uh, to one lender and all of the properties are, are put under one loan. Um, as Donald had mentioned earlier, our bridge programs are really, are extremely popular right now. Um, especially if you talk about in really competitive markets in the US. Um, so the, the bridge loans, you can close same as cash. So basically we can close a transaction in the US um, in a period of 10 days uh, on a bridge transaction. Um, and what you would do is you would come in, you would put a cash offer in on the property. So it um, basically takes anybody out that is uh, looking at regular conventional financing just from a time basis. And you would come in and you would close uh, with a bridge loan. We would then come in and refinance it within a 90-day period um, and, put, you know, and put it back into a proper loan. Um, bridge loans also help you increase liquidity. You know, we see a lot of issues uh, with clients uh, where their businesses have been impacted with COVID. Perfectly fine. Um, these are purely asset-based loans. So whatever your current financial situation is, it's not going to be taken into consideration. It's going to be, what is that property worth? How much are you looking to extract? And uh, you know, what is the current situation? So um, those, are the, those are the types of loans that, that we offer. Next slide. So I think that's, uh, I think that's it for our presentation. Uh, we're gonna have a, a question and answer period. Um, so feel free to, um, to put the questions in. We'll read the questions out so everybody can, um, can have the opportunity to hear. And thank you for your time. I uh, appreciate it. And we look forward to uh, uh, working with you in the future. Thanks so much, Ro um, Robert and Donald. Um, do you want to just quit share screen?
actress. So we actually do have uh, a first question. It says, if the property is in Manhattan and the underwriters, the mortgages are New York, are the new mortgages underwriters New York State base, is there a preference for apartments, walk ups, and co ops? It's a very good question. Um, most, well, all of our lenders for the US are going to be onshore lenders. It doesn't mean that they're going to be in New York. What makes us very unique is because we're a, a broker that has opportunities in all 50 states, we're going to find you the best loan program. That, that could be a lender in New York. It could be a lender in California. Um, for the preference of apartments, walk-ups, and co-ops, um, everything is fine. Uh, co-ops are a bit more difficult um, you know, for obvious reasons, so I would recommend staying away from it, but um, that's always available. If there's a, a question that I see in regarding Spanish property, um, is there room for helping with a mortgage for Spanish property for US persons or a company? So the, the short answer is yes. Um, now for Spanish property, obviously it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been a really kind of a popular destination, whether it's for the whether it's for the visa passport or it's just a beautiful place to, I guess, have a home. Uh, these are high net worth loans and we work with onshore uh, lenders. So the loan amount for a Spanish loan would have to be minimum 1 million euros. But these are all very, very bespoke. Um, it's not really sort of a kind of a cookie cutter type program that you would have, say, in, uh, in say Canada, UK or the US. So definitely. Um, and would be would love to have the opportunity to kind of discuss this uh, with you. So I think Donald does a question about do we offer loans in Japan? <laughs> uh, that's that's uh, the the no uh, we we don't we used to I think um, you know everything that we do we don't do just because we can. We need to make sure that uh, the experience is good. Um, and again, because we deal with a lot of uh, institutional relationships like private banks or external asset managers, we need to make sure that we can control that experience for the client. And in, in Japan, unfortunately, it's just not doable. Uh, uh, the, the, we could explore, uh, but it's, it's really difficult. You'd also have to fly to Japan to sign the documents, um, the loan applications are mailed. Uh, it's really an old fashioned type of, uh, you know, system. Uh, and also definitely not Hokkaido or Niseko. Um, to the extent that it could be available, it would really just be Tokyo and some of the bigger cities. And we have a question. Would you recommend purchasing via personal name or local corporation? Would there be any difference in taxes? I'm assuming that's for the US, um, we allow the borrower uh, to vest or to have own title um, in a corporate entity. Uh, we also allow blockers. So it's very common for somebody to hold a property in an LLC and then use an, uh, like a BVI blocker uh, for tax reasons. Um, whether or not it, it saves you taxes or it's more for the benefit of um, uh, you know, keeping your, your personal wealth uh, away from any kind of legalities between the property, that's something you would have to discuss with your, your accountant or, or your, uh, your legal advisor. Okay, what else do we have? We have a couple of other questions that were actually came to me via WhatsApp. Are there, are there any, where are people buying right now? Where are the hot places like in the US as well as in, as well as, as Australia, like you said, Donald, Australia was being, was becoming quite popular, Australia and, and let's say the UK. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that's a, first of all, I think property in general has just really been really uh, hot. I'll let Robert talk about sort of which, which areas of the US, but globally, um, Everything's been quite robust. I would say demand from Hong Kong in particular to the UK has been phenomenal. Um, Australia for, 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 for Asia in general has been very robust just because I think it's close. They have a good school system. You know, you know the, the housing is, is beautiful and it's new. 
Uh, but by far, um, you know, as, as far as sort of kind of vacation type homes, you know, Europe has been very popular, but US has been really on fire. Um, I have to say, you know, just from a yield perspective, it's the highest yielding market in the world. Um, and it's only going to get higher as but we have a we have a we have a macro team that writes economic pieces uh, on sort of the outlook for for this type of stuff. And they're saying that, you know, the rental yields are only going to get higher and higher as, you know, as as as, you know, buyers will struggle with the ability to get a mortgage onshore. And so, you know, rental yields, you know, will, will go up. But I'll let Robert kind of elaborate which which areas of the US he's seeing the most uh, interest. So I, I think if you look at where foreigners are buying, at least for us anyway, um, you have the typical states where people want trophy assets, you know, New York, San Francisco, LA, Beverly Hills, that kind of thing. But if somebody is looking at a pure investment, most of the time we're seeing them buying in Texas, uh, Nevada, Arizona, uh, states that um, have a high uh, growth rate. People are leaving New York, they're leaving California and they're going, they're going central. Um, so you see the housing markets there are, are fantastic and rental yields are, are, especially if you take Texas, for example, a lot of corporations are moving in there. If I'm not mistaken, I think Tesla just announced that they were going to be moving to Texas. So it creates a huge market for investors uh, to be able to purchase rental properties. A lot of people that will relocate won't buy a property on the initial uh, relocation. They're going to rent, find the right area, and then they're going to buy something. You know, I just I think just to add, you know, one of the benefits of what we do is we actually get to see um, see the action on the ground, as they say. So when we see kind of the rental rental income that they're getting and the price they paid, and I know you can Google this, but these are facts. I mean, rental yields in the U.S. specific, I mean, in, specifically say in Texas and in Florida, they're you know high single, low double digits, um, and you know that's phenomenal. Um, with a share price appreciation uh, option uh, embedded in, the, in that in, in that investment. Do you do you actually get the reverse? Like, do you get your other clients overseas wanting to buy in the Philippines, wanting to buy property in the Philippines? And do you are there any kind of um, restrictions yeah. to that? Or yeah, that? you know, um, the short answer is yes, we do. I mean, it's not it's not a typical, um, you know, kind of a, a major market for sort of our clientele. But yes, and you know, the trouble with the Philippines, although, is that we it's we're unable to offer financing. I think we were trying to do it through uh, PNB uh, a while back, but you know, you know, these you know because you know, like everything in the world, whenever there's growth people are going to flock to it. And I think Philippines, whether that's in, you know, the fort or, you know, parts of the fort or even some parts of Makati, property prices have gone really, really strong and people just pay cash, you know? Yeah, no, I noticed that. I, yeah, that, that um, people are kind of plopping down cash to, to buy a property here just to bypass all the kind of labyrinth yeah. mortgage yeah. requirements. Yeah. Yeah. But there is interest from overseas. Totally. Yeah. And I think actually, you know, some of the islands are starting to get, obviously, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, some of the islands are, are there's only one direction, right? They're only going to get more popular, uh, whether that's Shargao or some parts of Palawan. Um, you know, if you take a longer term view, these are, you know, there are not many places in Asia that have that type of topography um, and water and beaches. Um, so I might be a little biased, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm very, uh, pro Philippines. <laughs> Thanks. It's nice to hear. Although there, yeah, there, there are islands available for purchase, you know, every now and then. Um, why don't we move to the UK now where we have a question from Vince Garcia about the current 20 years fixed rates for UK home. Would you be able yeah, to Yeah, you know, um, so that, so you know, the presentation that we did say it's around, you know, including the, the Bank of England tracker rate, it averages around either two to 4%. And that, um, that number really depends on the lender and the AUMs. Like, 
you know, like I said, you know, it's just like anything in life, like the lower the rate, you know, they're going to ask you for more requirements and it'll take longer and it'll be, it could get frustrating. So I think, you know, our job is to say, listen, you know, are you a busy entrepreneur? And, you know, and, you know, then this is not going to be for you. Trust me, you're going to get frustrated. Nobody's going to be happy, but maybe you have a personal assistant that can do all this for you or, you know, somebody that can help, then it's worth a try, right? Um, so we really kind of work through this and give you real honest, you know, uh, advice on, on, on that. So yeah, it's about, you know, two to 4% uh, for, a, for a 20 year fix. I'm just thinking off on what you said earlier, um, Donald. This is like a little bit anecdotal on my part, but apparently, uh, well, you were saying that in the Philippines, people, a lot of the transactions for property tends to be in cash, right? Because of, you know, whatever the loophole or the, the rigmarole that you have to go through. Um, whereas I've, in the UK, I've just learned that um, you can't even deposit cash over the counter unless it's to your own personal account. Like for example, I was trying to deposit cash to my daughter's account. And apparently you can't, you, you, everything now is, is online, digital, whatever. I mean, yeah. there are no cash transactions anymore. And they explain, which makes sense. It was because of money laundering yeah. Yeah. concerns, right? Does that necessarily happen in the US or any of the other countries? Yeah, that that's, a really, that's a really good question. So um, the short answer is, I think globally, uh, everybody's on slightly heightened alert on this, you know, you know, money laundering and AML issues. Um, ironically, the U S is probably a little more lax. Um, you know, it's also the breadth and depth and size of the property market. It's just, it's so big. Right. Um, and like I, you know, like the, one of the slides, you know, you know, it's 60 to 70% of people are, are paying in cash. Now there are, once you get a mortgage, there are definitely some, you know, AML requirements in terms of funds being seasoned. You know, if you get, if you get a chunk of money in from a relative, they have, there has to be a paper trail, but I would say uh, the UK and Europe in particular, uh, UK, the regulatory uh, landscape is really, really strict. Uh, and I think, you know, UK is kind of a center of a lot of that type of activity. Um, so yeah, it's it's not um it's not as easy as a you know as a, it doesn't pay to you know it doesn't pay uh, you know there are a lot of there are a lot of people in this world maybe a little bit older they you know they're affluent you know we they still keep money you know you know in the safe <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have a, everything in, in, now is contactless even right sorry you can't even ride the bus yeah um, uk without a credit card contactless credit card or or your you know something on yeah, your phone yeah, and you just yeah, yeah. it's insane yeah yeah, yeah. Sorry, Robert, i interrupted you that's no, okay no it's okay so we have a couple questions um uh, one is in case you have ample liquidity to acquire the entire purchase in cash would it still be advisable to go through a mortgage it, I mean, obviously, we're going to say yes, but I, I think there's a lot of reasons why. Again, if you're just specifically talking about the U.S., um, besides inheritance tax, which is based on the equity-free portion of the property that's taxed, um, just in general, if you're able to pay cash for one property, why not buy two or three with, with leverage, especially if you're going to be able to um, uh, get the yield that, that you're looking for. So in my opinion, and we get this uh, a lot of, you know, people are, are saying, why would I pay with cash? Why would I get a mortgage when I can pay with cash? Interest rates right now are, go, are at the cheapest they've ever been in the US. Um, so, I mean, it, it's definitely advantageous to pay with uh, cash. A uh, question is, do you help uh, get pre-approved for a mortgage? And it must be property specific. It's a, a very good question. Um, before you start shopping for a property, we always recommend that you get pre-approved. Um, so what you would do would be, you would go through the, the process and it, it can be very, very quick and, and quite painless. It's, we make the programs very simple. Once you get qualified for the loan, once you submit all the documentation, 
Um, it takes us about 72 hours to get you a full underwritten approval. Once we get you that approval, then we issue you a letter. And then once you have that letter, you can go shopping. You know, I want to kind of just add on to one question uh, from Bambina uh, earlier was, you know, where are people buying? You know, just to kind of, just to touch on, so we have two separate sides of the business. You know, we have a very sort of a high net worth type of uh, team and product. Um, you know, I think what, what this COVID-19 has done to everybody, it's that it's made you think about the next stage of your life sooner. So my, my you know, I have kids in school. I'm not thinking about where they're going to go to college, but now I am. I want to think about, you know, what, what is my quality of life? And I, you know, in the U S you can't really beat it. I mean, obviously the English countryside is very nice. The beaches in Marbella are very nice, but you know, we see a lot of uh, high net worth uh, families in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Singapore, and, you know, LA, Bel Air, 15 million, 20 million. I mean, these are, you know, 10 million, these are monster houses, but these are, these are generational homes. It's a great quality of life, you know, in New York, you know, obviously these really swanky, um, you know, luxury condos, but this is, this has kind of made you think maybe, you know, I don't need to just, just make money, but maybe think about, you know, enjoying it a little bit. <laughs> and so we do see a lot of the kind of those type of transactions more than we did before. Well, okay, on a personal note though, um, Donald, where would you consider buying yourself? You're saying you're based in Singapore. You yeah, know, yeah. College. Yeah, so with, without a doubt, without a doubt. So, you know, we, you know, we have a place uh, in California. I, you know, I went to school there. Um, I've had that for quite a bit, um, but without a doubt, it would be in Texas. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that. One is, one is that what the U.S. offers more than other countries is that it gentrifies really well, right? So if you if you find that you're not earning enough in one state, for you to pick up pick up and rent a U-Haul and drive to Texas, no other place in the world can that be done, right? And you can drive an Uber and you know and, and support a family, but you know as taxes become more of an issue, because, you know, I mean, corporations haven't been paying their fair share and, you know, whatever we read in the news, you know, it's gonna flock to those type of places. Texas is a real big beneficiary and I think there's more room to go. And also Florida, you know, uh, but Texas by far. Um, another thing is what, what's been an interesting, you know, I think Robert will have to confirm this, but we see a lot of um, college town demand, you know, where, you know, whether that's Boston or Philly, obviously LA, but you know, where guys go in and they say, well, you know, you know, these, there's only a certain number of, you know, four year universities in the U S but the applicants they're, they're going up, you know, and that's a lot of that's from Asia, from China, India, you know, you name it. And, you know, a lot of these Asians, they don't want to send their, put their kids in a dorm. They'd rather buy an apartment, you know, the old fashioned way. And maybe after they graduate, they can sell it and pay for that. You know, how our parents used to think. And, and that is a really interesting um, kind of trend that we've seen um, where they go in and maybe get a few of these, you know, kind of, a, you know, college apartment type dorms where the rental yields are really high because people will pay. Yeah, no, I noticed that as, as well, you know, with, as our kids are going into college or have gone through college, it's become more and more of a consideration um, yeah. to get something that either they can stay in and, and they pay their utilities or they pay rent, you know, in, yeah, in lieu yeah. of paying for a dorm. And, and so. you know, it's kind of like a safety valve, right? You know, you have your, your son or daughter studying abroad, you know, whether you're in, you know, Indonesia or Vietnam or someplace where you never know you know, what the world is going to be like, but, you know, maybe they get a job there and at least they have the property, they have the job and, you know, uh, there's a little more security. And it's character building for the kids, right? <laughs> 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 they have to take care of the utilities. Yeah. And, well, yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. Uh, to follow them yeah. around in the US or UK. <laughs> okay, well, 
uh, Robert, do you have anything to add? Because no, yeah, I just want to. I want to thank you and and your staff. You've been fantastic, and appreciate everybody that spent the time online. And you know, we if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out, email us, uh, give us a call. We're you know, we're happy to help. Yeah, right. we'll we'll send we'll send you guys a copy of the presentation. If anyone wants it, just drop us a note, um, and we'll send it to you. And otherwise, of course, this will be up on YouTube probably in the next two days, um, the full the full webinar, and you can always refer to it uh, when you when you have time. And of course, we'll also include the contact numbers of um, Donald and and Robert and GMG and American Mortgages as well. Maybe I'd like you guys to maybe summarize what we said. Any last words like why? Why go with you? Why buy abroad as well? And, yeah, well, I think I think it's it's fairly simple. It's like, you know, why do you go to Amazon? Because they've helped you find the best. They've given you options for you to decide what's the best option for you. We're not trying to one shoe fits all. We give you options. If the, you know, if this suits you, then we, we put all of our effort into making that a dream for you. Um, so we're about we're about we're about solutions. We're not trying to sell you. Our, we're not a bank trying to sell you, you know, trying to meet our quota. We're trying to help help clients. And I think in a world where there's more information, people are looking for yield, people are looking for just more diversification, back to our core statement, we want to make this easier for everybody and fairer and take away the friction and the cost and the speed for this. Great. Thank you so much, Donald. Robert, do you want to just close off the discussion? Uh, sure. You know, again, as I had mentioned uh, earlier, it, especially if you're talking about the U.S., our only focus are borrowers like yourself. Um, you know, again, we 100% of our borrowers are foreign nationals or expats. So with that said, again, all the issues that you would have with a traditional bank, or uh, you know, finance institution, you're certainly not going to have. So, um, yeah, that's my that's my little pitch. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. And guys, if you're looking for property to buy overseas, you know who to call. Um, I get ten percent of every sale, right? <laughs> Donald, for <my> that's it. <laughs> 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 well, I'm open to negotiations <laughs> for more. All so right. thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank I hope you. you enjoyed the food. It looks really, really yummy. And join us um, next week, um, Wednesday next week at 3 p.m. We've got to talk about COVID and how it's affected teens and um, children. So oh, what a good topic. Yeah. yeah, it's a great topic. Right. Join us, please. Yeah, we'll do. Okay, All right, thanks. have a good evening, everybody. Thank you again, Babiana. Thanks, everyone. Bye.